Welcome to our Hot Rod Bible Study. So tonight we're going to be in 1 John chapter 2, um, verses 12 through 17 tonight. And so one of the things as we've been uh, studying through the Word of God, the thing that's been so amazing that the Word here in John, as I, I've been speaking to you about, that uh, it is so different than Peter. I don't know about you guys, but it has been coming over so loving. And I really loved our, our last study. And I think it fit very well um, And last Sunday with Pastor Greg's message there at the church. But uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go ahead and read through the six verses, and then we'll go back and we'll see uh, what it is that the Lord has for us. But before we get started tonight, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together. So, Father God, we, um, as we came before you, Lord, tonight, Lord, in our, in our prayers, Lord, and all the things that we have laid at our feet, Father, we come tonight, Lord, humbly, Lord, wanting to lay this study tonight at your feet, Father, and ask that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would um, not only speak to us, Father, that you would al allow us, Lord, to take in your word and not only take it in, Father, but we, we go it out, take it out and share it with others, Father. Help us, Lord, to be used by you. We pray all of these things tonight, Father, and we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So here we go. We'll start off here in verse 12 of First uh, John chapter 2. So it says, I write to you, uh, little children, because your sins are forgiven, you for my name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So as we've been studying through the book of John here, it's been such an amazing time that we've been spending in the book of John so loving that we see John. But some of the things that we've, as we've been studying through here, one of the things early on that John spoke to us about, that he wanted us to go into the world, and he wanted us to shine the light for Jesus Christ. And, and we see that as we spend time with God, that that light, that it would come through us. And I think that those couple of chapters that we went through that, it really, really spoke to us that we would go into the world and shine that light. But one of the things that he um, talked to us, and this letter was written, that we would have fellowship with God. And I think this is one of the things that we need to understand is, as we as believers, we want to have fellowship with God and we want to walk with God daily. Many times um, we, we sing a song here, just a closer walk with you. And it is so touching that we see that in the book of John, this fellowship, and we learned that how is it that we as a sinful man would have fellowship with God? And it would be that in 1 John 1, 9, we learned that if we would confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our, of our sins and cleanse us from all. And this is the word that I like so much in this verse, the word all, and it is from all unrighteousness. And so all the things that we have done in the past, and I know many times the enemy comes and he whispers in our ear, you, do you think that the people at the Bible study or you think the people at the church, you think they knew what you did on December 13th and 1935? Did you think they know what you did? Um, and all these things that the enemy puts on our hearts. But one of the things that we need to be reminded, if we truly give our lives to Christ and if we pray this prayer and we confess, and we, we heard that, the word humo dogeo, that, that says that we would say the same thing that God says about our sin. We are in agreement with God that it is sin, that we have met, out, stepped outside the boundaries of what God says that is correct for our lives. And it's so powerful that we see that. But as we uh, spend time in the Word of God, learning the things of God, one of the things in um, Galatians, and we went through this last week, and one of the things that I left out, and I love, this is the reason why I love that you guys come up and you guys talk after the study, because one of the things that I left out, that we know when we spend time with the Lord, that He puts this love in our heart, and we spoke about this last week, and that He puts that, that fruit of the Spirit, and we remember that the first word in the fruit of the Spirit is love. Right, And I'll just really quickly, it is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
um, gentleness and it's self-control. And one of the things that I left out last week that I should have shared with you, it is it, it says there in that same verse, it says, against such there is no law. And so it is when we go into the world and we kill people with the kindness of Christ that against this there is no law. People don't know how to defend themselves. When you go into the workplace and you meet someone and you give them a harsh word, they, they know how to come back to, at you with another harsh word. But when they come to you with a harsh word and you come with, to them with love, they don't know how to defend themselves against love. All they know, they, 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 they're taken off they're taking off of their balance that they don't understand what it is that you're, you're bringing into them, the love that you're sharing with them. And so this is one of the things that John has spoken to us about, the love. And, and one of the things that tonight he is going to speak to us about spiritual growth in the first three verses that we're going to get into tonight, that he's going to speak to us about spiritual growth and the things that we're doing um, in, that we can grow in. But one of the things that I want to share with you tonight, and I think um, it is fitting um, for this study tonight, is that something um, that happened? And many of you, you know the story of the Calvary Chapel movement. And I don't do this to, to draw any attention to Calvary Chapel, but some of the things that I, I really wanted to share with you, and I think this is so interesting to me about the Calvary Chapel movement, that we remember that it was uh, there was 25 people that gathered together on uh, December 5th, 1965, and they gathered there in a church called Calvary Chapel with with uh, Pastor Chuck Smith, who we all know is of here from uh, from from California, and so he had a heart for the. We remember that he had a heart to do things for God, and his heart. And I love this that as we were studying there with Pastor Greg on on Sunday. But one of the things that he said that he said that that really really spoke to me that people as us as believers that oftentimes that God is looking for people whose heart is turned towards him and asking themselves, use me, Lord, use me. And one such person was Pastor Chuck Smith. And that we see that he had such a heart for the things of God. And one of the things that I wanted to share with you tonight, and I think it's, it's so touching, that we see that it's a fact that of the Christian faith that God often uses small things and seemingly obscure saints to accomplish his broader purposes. And we see as these 25 people that they gathered there in this Calvary Chapel that they couldn't envision what it was that was going to come through the Calvary Chapel movement. You know, uh, Pastor Chuck went to be with the Lord in 2013, but he had this tremendous vision for the things of God, and he had a, such a heart to want to be used by God. And so one of the things that I wanted to share with you tonight is that he led tens of thousands of people to the Lord. We all know this, that he led tens of thousands of people to the Lord. But one of the things that, that I learned through this, um, through studying through this, that he was actually before he, and many of you knew this, you know the, the after story of Pastor Chuck Smith, but what many of you don't know is that in the early 60s, 61, 62, 63, somewhere in that area, that he was, they, they considered him to be like kind of a, uh, he was a pastor. And not only that, though, he was still working in the workplace. He worked for a grocery store called Alpha Beta Market. And he worked there as a produce manager. And one such occasion that he can recall, he says that he remembers running his union dues, which were $50. Um, he actually ran his union dues up to $416. And you can imagine in 1961-63, you can imagine how that's a tremendous amount of money. And so even though that he had a heart for the things of God, he contemplated leaving the ministry because he said that his, he was putting his family in debt and his church at the time was not growing. This was before the Calvary Chapel was not growing. And so he was thinking about leaving it. And unbeknownst to him, he said the next day, and this is the reason why I talk to you gentlemen about those, those, uh, those, those things that God puts in our lives, that unbeknownst to him, the very next day, a family friend sent him a check for $425. And he was able to pay his union dues, take his family out of debt, and continue the ministry because he had a heart for the things of God. And we all know that as soon as he got, a couple of years later, as he stayed in that ministry, he came and he was asked to come and pastor the Calvary Chapel movement. And so one of the things that I wanted to share is he saved these tens of, of, of thousands of people. One such person, and this is powerful, this is where the story gets interesting, that he saved, that this man comes to his church and, and accepts Christ. His name is Richard Snyder. His name doesn't mean any to, anything to you right now, but he is the son of Harry and Esther Snyder, the founders 
of In-N-Out Burger, the founders of In-N-Out Burger. And so we see that they come, and because Pastor Chuck had a heart to share the gospel with the world, that this uh, Richard Snyder comes and he accepts um, this invitation. He comes in, in and he, this In-N-Out Burger comes and he starts to come to, the, to, to uh, their Cal- Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, in the early years, he starts to come, and in 19, it says there in 1983, he gives his life to Christ, and he becomes a, a follower of Christ, and he and it begins to work on him, and not only him in the workplace, but he, as he accepts Christ, he wants to share that. He has a heart for evangelism, and he wants to share that with other people, and he's trying to think about ideas of how he can share that, that love of Christ with others. And so in 1987, as he takes over In-N-Out Burger, he uh, ordered that Bible verses would be put on all the condiments there at In-N-Out Burger. And it's so powerful, and I, and I wanted to share this with you tonight because I believe it's powerful that we see a man who, Pastor Chuck Smith, who had such an idea and had such a love um, for, the, for the things of God, that through this Richard Snyder, that he, through his evangelism, we all see that here, John 3, 16, right, is on their drink cup, right? For God so loved the world, right? That he sent his one, or he gave his one and only begotten son, that whoever believeth on him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. And we see the, the other scripture that he here, he put Proverbs 3, 5, he put it on the milkshake cup right? Milkshake cup. And so Proverbs 3, 5, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And we see some of the things that he had such a heart to want to share the love of Christ. And we see here the boats that they use, Proverbs 24, 16. Um, we, well, I'll look up some of these, but the story's going to get lengthy if I read all of the, the Bible verses. But I wanted to see, but one of the things that I didn't know as I was uh, reading the story, that I didn't know that on the wrapper of the double-double, that it also has Bible verse, and it has uh, Nahum 1.7. And I'll read that one to you because it is short. And it says, The Lord is good, and uh, is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows uh, those who trust in him. So powerful that we see. And so the last one is their burger wrapper, which has Revelation 3.20. Um, the only um, item that I did not get or not bring, it is their coffee cup. And their coffee cup actually has Luke 635 on their coffee cup. But one of the things tonight that I wanted to share with you, it's an amazing thing that somebody like Pastor Chuck, that he has been, um, went to be with the Lord in 2013. But one of the things that I think is so powerful that we see that somebody like Pastor Chuck that would have such a heart to touch the people for the gospel of Christ. And we see that as Richard Snyder died in a plane crash, um, in 1993, and his uh, niece Lindsay took over um, took over Snyder, took over the franchise. She's actually the CEO today, and she has such a heart for the things of God. But she wanted to honor God, and she wanted to honor her uncle and her father, who also worked for the In and Out Burger. But through that, they wanted to continue to place the scripture on. Uh, on all the condiments there at In-N-Out Burger. But one of the things that we wanted to, I wanted to share with you that's so powerful um, that it is that one of the things that Pastor Chuck used to say all the time, and he says, where God guides, God provides. And these are one of the areas that we see that God continues to provide and he continues to guide us in those areas. And it's just so powerful that we see. And, and, and one of the things that spoke to me through this story is that many times I think, that as Calvary Chapel, they started their very first, as they were in a building, there was 25 of them. But when he was given the Calvary Chapel, there was only 12 of them, and they were in a small tent. And it's just so amazing that, that after uh, Pastor Chuck Smith has been gone since 2013, and this Richard Snyder the, the, uh, that was at the time the CEO of In-N-Out Burger, they're long gone, and they went to be with the Lord. But there is still generations that, be, that are being touched for the gospel of Jesus Christ today in 2022. And it's just so powerful. And it just gets me thinking that what are we doing, men? And this is speaking to me. What are we doing for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation that they would be touched for the gospel of Jesus Christ? And so I just wanted to share that with you tonight. And we'll get into the study tonight. And so here in verse 12, it says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. Forgiven you for his namesake. 
The word he uses here, um, I write to you little children, the word he uses in the original Greek is the word, we've used it last week, we saw it last week, is the word technia, and is referring to offspring of any age. And so these are, what he's referring to here, John is referring to believers. He's referring to believers of any age, that people that come and know Christ, that this is what he is, he is referring to here. And it says, because your sins are forgiven. And, and we learned, we just talked about uh, first, uh, first John 1 John 1.9, that, that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And this is how we are forgiven, by confessing our sins, and we renew our relationship with God. This is how we come into that relationship with God. Um, but one of the things that I, that I love here in this verse, that we see it, it is for his name's sake. And this is speaking about what the finished work of Christ on the cross, for his name's sake, for what Jesus had done for each and every one of us on the cross. It is because of his namesake that we are saved. It is through his namesake that we are saved. And it's just such a, Christ has such a heart for his children, who we are if we have accepted Christ. But this reminded me of a story of a guy that was speaking to his friend and he wanted to share with his friend that, that he was, uh, every time that he got in an argument with his wife, his wife, every time he got in an argument with his wife, he said, his wife becomes historical. And, and he said, well, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean? He said, don't you mean hysterical? Doesn't your wife get hysterical when you get in an argument? And he said, no, no, she gets historical. He said, I don't understand. He says, well, what she does, though, is she tells me, she says, hey, I remember um, in 1983 that you opened the door and you, you did this. And I remember that two weeks ago that you forgot to go and do this and you forgot to do this. And she says that his wife, he said his wife becomes historical, that she remembers all these things where he has failed her in the past. But one of the things that we see that God is not that way, that we see that, that Hebrews 8.12 says that your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. Your sins and your lawless deeds. And one of the things that we speak about grace, that this is the grace of God. He chooses not to remember our sins. He is God. He could remember our sins if he wanted to, but he chooses not to remember our sins because he wants to have that fellowship, that fellowship with us, with each and every one of us. It is so powerful that we would see that he wants to have that fellowship with us. So here in verse 13, it says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you little children because you have known the father. You see, as, as here John, as he's speaking about a spiritual maturity, there is three uh, people that he's referring to, and we're going to see that in this verse here. He's referring to little children, and, we, and it's very simple to figure out that the little children he's going to refer to is going to be people that are new in the faith. Right, And so he's going to refer to young men, and the young men has been people who have accepted Christ and have been walking and have that foundation, but they're not mature Christians yet, as of yet. And he's speaking to the fathers, and the fathers are the mature Christians. But one of the things that I wanted to share with you tonight is we see these lists of three people that he's speaking about in, in their maturity level as they come to know Christ. One of the things that I, I want you to understand is it has nothing to do with age. There can be mature Christians. Somebody can be a father, and, and this is, doesn't have anything to do with gender. This is speaking to women as well, that there can be women who are very young, but they can be fathers in the faith that they can have that spiritual maturity with God. It has nothing to do with age. There is somebody that can be 80 years old and still be a little children because they haven't grown in the things of God. But this is, it has nothing to do with it. And so oftentimes I think when we refer to fathers, we have this idea in our head that it must be somebody that's, you know, really up there in age. No, it could be somebody who's only 35, 40 years old. It could be somebody who's been in their life spending time and they're spiritually mature. But one of the things that I want to leave with you with that thought is that it doesn't matter how spiritual, spiritual maturity you are, spiritual mature you are, you never arrived. Nobody ever gets to the point where they said, well, I know everything I need to know about the Bible. I know everything I need to know about God. Nobody has ever arrived. Nobody has ever arrived. We're all students. We're all disciples, discipulos of Christ. We're all disciples of Christ. And we're, 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 this is where we're, we're, all of us are trying to learn more of the things of God.
And so here, really quick, it says, I write to you fathers. And so we see that the, he is referring to the mature, the mature men and women, the mature Christians. This is who he's speaking to of here. And it says, because you have known him who is from the beginning. The word known in the Greek is the word gnoskos. And we, we spoke about this a couple of weeks about the word gnoskos is the word that we have a, uh, a relationship with God. That we, the re how we know God is for some of the things that he has brought us through in the past, as we talked about the job that we talked about a few minutes ago, that we, this is how we know God, is because that fellowship, that intimacy that we've had with Christ. This is how we know, and this is the know that he's talking about here in the Greek. It is the word gonoskos. And it says that we have known him from the beginning. That it says, I write to you, young men. He refers now to the young men. And these are men that are not fully mature yet. These are men that are not fully mature um, and we says, because you have overcome the wicked one. And we're going to get into in, in, in verse 14 about the wicked one. Uh, but one of, the, one of the things I wanted to share with you about knowing God and experiencing God, um, one of the things that we remember that Philippians 3.10 10 says that, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And Galatians 2.20 says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That when we have that relationship with Christ, that it is no longer we who live, it is Christ living in us. And, and you know, Pastor Greg had said something this past week that really spoke to me as well. One of the things that he was speaking about, that not only that our hearts would be turned and asking God to use us, to be used us for the things of God, but one of the things that really spoke to me as, I, as we see here in this verse, one of the things that, that really spoke to me that we would be, people that not only would would want to know God more that we would be people that would go out and actually and 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 he was talking about the fruit remember he was talking about the fruit that you don't hear any sounds right out in the garden when when orange trees they're not trying to grunt and they're not trying to become an orange or becoming whatever fruit they are to have that fruit and this is what he is speaking to us as Christians. We, we, we can't go into the workplace and, and grunt and say, you know what, I don't like this person, but I'm going to force myself to talk to them and try to be nice to them. No. When we spend time abiding with God, that this will just come out of us. It'll flow out of us. That this is what he is speaking about. And this is what I loved about his study, that that's what will flow out of us. The love of Christ will flow out of us when we spend that time with God. And it's so powerful that we would we would do those things and we would have that trust in God. So here, uh, still in verse 13, it says, Because you have overcome the wicked one, I write to you little children. Now this little children, this is a different word in the Greek. And even though that in the English it comes out the same, that it is the word uh, pation. And it means that an infant, and so it is referring to somebody that is new in the walk with Christ, that there are a new Christian, a new uh, believer, a new follower. And so he is laying out the, the foundation of these three different. And so here, this is the reason why he uses that word. And it says, because you have known the Father, and knowing the Father is have putting our trust in Christ, that we would put our trust in him. And here in verse 14, it says, I have written to you fathers, um, once again, the mature fathers, because you have known him um, who is from the beginning. And we remember as we know him from we've known from the beginning. Remember that John was writing this letter to to um, to inform of the false doctrine that was going on. Right. We remember that he was talking about the false doctrine that was going on at, at that time. And so he addresses that. And remember that early on that John, that he spoke to them. And it, this comes from uh, First John 1 John 1.1, and it says, which we have uh, from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, um, which with, with our own eyes, and which we have looked upon in our hands, and we have held concerning the word of life. And so we see that in, in 1 John 1.1, 1 John 1, that we see that, that not only is John saying, I held him, I, 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 I heard him, and I, I, I can see him. He is an eyewitness to the things of Christ that we would see that he is an eyewitness of the things of God. Go ahead, JJ. Yeah. Um, Mike, do you have any, any idea? Did your study Bible give you some clues as to why the change in tense between... Yes, yes, absolutely. I, we were going to get into that. Yes, we had seen before that I write to you that he has written to him, the thing that he was writing. But here in verse 14 is the only one that says, I have written. 
that is something that he had already written to him in the past, that he had written to him previously. Um, this is what, what uh, in, in the commentary that it spoke to. Do you have something uh, else other than that he had spoke to him in the past? No, I just think that's interesting. It that, is. You know, the, the tense chant. In other words, I'm writing to you now, and mm -hmm. then I have written to you. To you, you yes. He somewhat repeats the same sure. you know, uh, uh, message in, in both verses. So. Sure, and, it, and it's, it's something that he is reassuring them that he had written to them once again. He had written to them before previously, and he's writing to them once again. He's writing to them about their spiritual maturity. And so he's writing to them of these things. And this is the reason why the difference in tenses. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't usually, I don't usually read. I mean, if it has in your study Bible, I usually don't read a study Bible. Um, but yeah, I, I, this is where I, I drew it from. Um, but yes, this is what it spoke about, that it was different tenses because this is the things that he had spoken about previously. Um, so it says, I have written to you, uh, young men, and this is one of the things as we get into this young men part here in verse 14, it says that they were not fully mature, but they had the foundations of Christ, that these people that were not mature. But one of the things that we see in this, that it says, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. We see that the strength that, that John is speaking about here is not the strength that they have. It's not a physical strength. It is a spiritual strength. And we see that where it is in this very verse, it tells us where they gather that spiritual strength from, and it is by abiding in the Word of God. And this is so powerful that we would see that it is when we abide in the Word of God, and it continues here, and that you would overcome the wicked one. And this is how we, as we walk through our daily life, that this is how we overcome the wicked one, by staying, abiding in the Word of God. And we, we heard about there in John 15, 5, we heard about what it is to abide, right? I am the vine, you are the branches, right? Um, it, it's so powerful that we see that when we, we're abiding in that, and we can very, very easily see that in our lives when we're working out in the garden. A couple of weeks ago, my boss had sent me out to go. There was a, a big branch that had fallen off, and he told me to go back and to, to cut it up and see if we could get it into the dumpster. And in the time that I was cutting all the branches off the, off the trunk of the tree, and I went and threw it in the, in the trash, I went back to get the trunk of it, and I sliced it up, and it took me a couple hours, and I sliced it up, and I went and to go take it back into the dumpster. One of the things that was so interesting to me is that when I went back into the dumpsters, that the branches that I had thrown there a couple of hours earlier, they were already wilting and they were already turning brown because they were no longer abiding in the tree any longer. And this is us, that if we don't abide in the word of God, this is the thing we become dry in the areas of our lives and in the, in the areas that we need God to speak into our lives. This is the areas that we become dry in. And so it's so powerful that we see this. But one of the things... As we, we contemplate these, these areas of our lives that we have these spiritual um, things going on in our lives, that we remember that, that here, and this is what Paul spoke, around, spoke about in Romans 7, 18. It says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells in me. And this is powerful to me because we see that it is because we abide in the things of God, because we have the potential, each and every one of us, to go out and sin there isn't anything that holds us back from going out and sinning, but when we understand that we have that potential, that this is the, we can see that we have a need to abide in the word of God, to stay connected to the things of God that would keep us from going into those areas. And, and this is powerful to me. It really, really spoke to me that we can keep us because there is a spiritual battle going on in each and every one of our lives. And we've spoken about this before. You see that the God wants us, God wants to control our lives but Satan wants to control our lives as well. He wants to draw us away from the things of God, but the best defense is to hide his word in our hearts. Psalms 119.11 says that your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you, Lord. And it says here, it says we should, we, and this is how he cleanses us, this is how he cleanses our way, and it comes from Psalm 119.9. It says, how can a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed according to your word. And so this is how we are cleansed, that we take heed according to the word of God, that we would be cleansed through his word, that he would be the washing of his word, as the Bible speaks about the washing of the word of God. And it's so powerful that we see that, that we, how we are cleansed um, through the word of God when we abide and stay in the word of God. It's so powerful that we see that. So here in verse 15, it says, Do not love the world, or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
As we get into this area, we can see that now we're shifting gears. And one of the things, JJ, as you speak about um, this first, the first three verses here, 12 through 14, uh, many of the commentators spoke about that there was um, other commentators or other Bible expositors that actually had questioned that if this was actually first originally part of the original text of 1 John, because you can see the writing in it is so changed from the story, and it's so different than the story, um, but it has been um, over many, many Bible commentators and expositors, expositors that they do believe that's part of the original canon of Scripture, and so this is the reason why it is here, and it kind of looks that it kind of shifts gears, and it talks about spiritual maturity in the middle of a kind of a of a of a sense of the of the whole paragraph of what's going on, but now he's speaking about the world that do not love the world, and this is interesting to me because as we have been studying with John, he has been all about love. Remember, he talked to us about he says a, an old commandment that I gave you that, that it's a new commandment and the same commandment and what he was speaking to, and we we talked about this before that this old commandment was, and it comes from John thirteen thirty four. I'm sorry. Of John 14, uh, 43, 34, that it says that you love one another as I have loved you, that we would love Christ as he has loved us. And so we see that John has been speaking to us that we are love, love, and he wants us to love each other. He wants us to love, but now he's ordering us here. He's calling us, not ordering us, he's calling us here not to love the world. And, and we really need to, to look at this as we, we, con we consider that he's calling us not to love the world. What is he speaking about? And, and I know many of you, as, as many of you share your stories with me, that a lot of you go on camping trips or go um, fishing with their grandsons, and you talk about these beautiful places. Don, when he was here a couple of weeks ago, he was speaking about going to Hawaii, and he showed me some beautiful pictures of the places that he's gone to Hawaii, amazing places um, that he's speaking about. But this is not the world that God is referring to. Go ahead, J.J. Yeah, that's the basic nature of sin. In mm -hmm. other words, God... I mean, that's paganism. In other words, God tells you, don't worship what I've provided for you. Don't worship, you know, the sky and the birds and the seas and the ocean and the breeze and all those things are beautiful things. Yes. Worship me. Me, yes. Words, yes. Right? I created you to bring you unto me. Me, yes. And don't worship what I've given you in abundance. Yes. In other words, that, and, you know, I gave this to you. Yes. Know? And, you know, some people say, well, I'm very spiritual. I'm one with nature. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just pure paganism. Sure. This. Sure. In words, sure. It's sinful. Sure, it's sinful because anything we put before God, JJ, as, as you're referring to, anything we put before God, it is sinful. That we are called not to put anything before God, and that, you know that's one of the things in the first, you know, the first commandment, right? To put no other gods before me. And this is one of the things that's so powerful um, that you see there in the in the Word of God that He's speaking about the world. And, and you're right that we should not. There's it's paganism as we go through and we worship the things of God. But what is John referring to here? He is talking about the world system. He's not telling us that we, and so as JJ is speaking about, as long as we, he, God has put uh, these things, these beautiful places, Hawaii, these places that you go and, and fish with your grandson and all these beautiful places in Northern California that you guys always speak about going to uh, Eureka and all these different places you guys speak about. He has given us those things. God has given us for our enjoyment that we can go in enjoyment as long as we're not putting them before the things of God. We're not saying, hey, well, we're going to go out and, and, and be in nature and we're no longer going to go to the church any longer. We're going to go out and be in nature and we're going to be enjoying what God has given us. No, we cannot put anything before God. But what God has is, is given us, those, he's given us those things for our enjoyment, for our pleasure, because he loves us. But one of the things that he's referring to here, he's speaking about the world system, the world system that is standing in opposition to God. And many of us, we, we were familiar with this because there's many things that we interact with on a daily basis. And I, I remember there was 20 or 30 years ago that these areas that I'm going to speak to you about, they weren't, they, they weren't as big as they are today. But we, we speak about them now today, like in the universities today, that we see that many universities were founded on biblical principles. But today that you see that even the universities that were started, they're, 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 they, they indoctrinate people that there is no God. Universities today indoctrinate people to tell them there is no God in our public school system. Remember that they doing everything they can to remove God from our public school system. And this is the area that, that Christ is speaking about that we are to hate. We are to hate the system that stands in opposition to God, that stands in opposition to who he is. 
and so trying to remove him. And, and we have a movement, and I don't want to bring it up, we have a movement that is alive and well in our time today that they are trying this new movement to try to bring people. And it's just so, it, it, this is definitely one of the areas where God is telling us not to love that system of the world. We are, we are called to love the things of God. Um, the areas of opposition, I spoke to you about the universities, public schools, also in the workplace. I, I don't remember when I was very young, and I just barely first got a job. I remember that my manager, um, she would speak to me about things of God. But I remember that later on I went to a place and they told me like part of my orientation was you're no longer allowed to talk about your religion. You're not allowed to talk about things about God. If somebody reports you, you could be written up for it. And so these are the areas. That, and this was as when I was growing up, I, I must have been in that time where it was, it, was a t it was OK at one time and then it wasn't OK at another time. But any system, the world system that stands in opposition to God. It says here, um, the love of the Father, um, as, as we got to the end of the verse here, as, as we're getting through this verse, it said the love of the Father is not in him. And, and we must think about these things. If there is people that the love of the Father is not in them, we've we got to really think about them. And this is one of the things that God has called us to, to that we know that God always has a heart for the lost. He's always had a heart for the lost. And we, 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 there's so many stories in the Bible that speak about people, the love that he has for people in the, uh, that are lost. But 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. They see that God has called us to hate the sin, but we are called to love the sinner. That even though that there is people that we probably interact on, with on a daily basis, if they are living a lifestyle that, is, that goes along with this worldly system, it doesn't mean that we are not to try to reach them for the gospel of Christ. That we are to try to reach them in love. We are not to, and, and we spoke about this many times, I don't think that there's people that are living lifestyles that we can go and tell them that, hey, you're living that lifestyle and you're going to go um, to the wrong place because you're living that lifestyle. That's not going to get them to turn. Remember that it is the love of Christ that draws men to Christ. It is the love of them that people would say that there's hope for them. And you know what? One of the things that, that I'm always, uh, that always intrigues me as we, as we walk, and, and many of us, we talk about this all the time, that our witness is the one of the things that is so powerful that, that we are, many of us, are, are, are the only Bible that our friends and our relatives will read, will be ourselves, that they'll read us and, they, and our walk. And many, many times we think that nobody's watching. They're watching. They're watching how you live your lives. And there's situations that you come up to, and if you have a wedding coming, coming a, a, maybe a wedding's coming or something's coming in your family, everybody in the family that knows you're a believer they're in the background trying to figure out, okay, I wonder what JJ's going to do. I wonder what Ron's going to do. I wonder what Jerry's going to do when they get to the wedding. Are they going to be like everybody else or are they going to be different? And, and our witness is so powerful that we can stand in. And, and, you know, many times, and I, and I think this is one of the things that, you know, as we speak about the church, the church is very, very good. The system of the church is very good about telling us as believers, as followers, that we are to follow Christ. And there is nothing wrong with that. But one of the things that I said that I see that uh, there's the Monday um, through Sunday, as we go to work, that we say, hey, we're no, at, we're no longer at church, that we think that we no longer have to serve God. But serving God is 24 hours, seven days a week that we serve God all the time. And this is one of the things, and as we spoke a little bit about um, In-N-Out Burger as we, we opened up the study tonight, uh, one of the things about In-N-Out Burger that they have that same um, biblical principle that we do all things unto God. And, and this is us as, as believers, that if, when we're in the workplace, if we are a mechanic, if we are, if we are a machinist, we are called to be the very best machinist, the very best mechanic that we can be, whether our boss is there or not. We are called to be the very best that God has given us, that we are to bring glory. And as you spoke about, J uh, JJ, one of the things that we have been created to bring glory to God, to bring glory to God. This is the reason why we have been created, to bring glory to him, that God, that people would see that. And, and this is powerful because I, and I know in my life that some of the things that, that I've walked in, in areas that I should not have walked of and, and people that knew me from before, that they see now that, that my life is still is still has a long way to go. I still have a long a lot of area to cover and to get into. But one of the things they say that if my, some of the people that know me, they say, you know what? If Mike Ramirez can is straightening out his life and he is serving the Lord, there is a God. There is a God because we can see that through his life that he is being changed. And we knew the life that he lived once before. 
Just like Paul, we can see in the Bible that the life he once lived, that they can see God through his life. We can see God. And it's powerful that many of us and many of you um, can have that same story behind it. It's so, so powerful that we see. So here in verse 16, it says, For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the, the pride of life um, is not of the Father, but of the world. And this is one of the areas, as we talk about sin um, tonight, one of the, the areas that we should be, um, and this is one of the, as Scripture here is pointing out, these are the three tactics that, the, that Satan uses on each and every one of us. This are the, these are the three tactics, and he uses the same tactics over and over and over and over again. Each and every one of us, and every single, and not, not all the time, but they say that eight times out of ten, we fall for it. And so we need to be aware of these tactics. And I wanted to share this with you because I think it's powerful that one of the things that Satan, that we see that the, as these tactics that we speak about, and first of all, I want to give you the definition, the lust of the flesh. Um, these are things um, that, are, are, that are in us, uh, I'm sorry, things that, are, that, are, that entice us to sin. Um, and it says the wants and desires of the flesh. That, that's what uh, the lust of the flesh is. Here in the lust of the eyes is things I see and I want. And this is, uh, is, is coveted, teen, uh, wanting something else that someone else has. And the pride of life is um, and like, I want to be liked by people. I want to be recognized by people. And I want people to think highly of me. This is what the, the pride of life is. And so we see that very early Satan started in the garden. And it's very early. It gets to Genesis 3, 6. And I'll read it to you here. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, you see, this was the lust of the flesh, that she saw that it was good for food. This was the lust, and this was the temptation that Satan was using with her. And here in the very next uh, word, it says that it was pleasant to the eyes. This was the lust of the eyes that, that Satan used. And the tree desirable to make one wise, that she was looking for something that that God would that that she would be made wise through eating from the tree of life. This is the pride of life, and this is the tactics that the enemy uses on each and every one of us, and the same tactics that he uses over and over and over again. And he used the very exact same tactics as when we remember that Satan tempted Jesus. The very exact tactics that he used on Jesus. And so us as believers, as followers of Christ, that we need to be aware of these tactics when there's something that we know that we see with our own eyes, that it is, if we have an enticement to it and is drawing to us, we need to be careful and we need to be aware this could possibly be the lust of the eyes. And the things of the flesh, we should need to be aware of those areas because Satan uses those things. And this is the area of the, that Satan always tempts us to in these areas of our lives. And so we need to be aware. Um, and, and, and one of the things that I, I wanted to share with you, um, and this, this, this is the one that where, where Jesus was tempted. And I know many of you, you think that it has something to, well, I'll just, I'll just tell you about, a little bit about it. And it comes from Matthew um, 4, um, verses 2 and 3. It says, uh, this is Jesus, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. And you can imagine that Jesus was beyond hungry when he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Remember that Jesus was all God, and he was 100% God, and he was 100% man. He was all God, and he was all man. So you can imagine that he was very hungry. And this is the area of where Satan comes and tempts us. Do you see that? Satan did not come in and tell him that he was hungry or, or he's going to make him a proposition here. He doesn't proposition us when we've gone 10 days and not eaten. No, he doesn't come when we've gone 20 days and not eaten. He weighs, waits until we're almost in desperation that we see that he here, Jesus, but he is God, right? He comes to him on that, on that after he has eaten his 40th, uh, 40th day. And he says, now when the, the tempter, listen to this, came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread, right? Command that these stones become bread. And you see that this is the lust of the flesh, right? This is what God is telling, or this is what Satan is telling each and every one of us. He's saying, rely on yourself. This is what he's telling Jesus. Rely on yourself. Don't rely on God. Rely on yourself. You can, you can make it happen. We see that God, Jesus had the power to turn those rocks, those stones into bread. But we see that we see that Jesus he he fought off uh, God, or fought off Satan with the word of God, 
And it's powerful that we see that he fought him off. But this was the lust of the flesh that he was trying to tempt him with. And he says, um, he said the eyes uh, that, we, that, that we need to pray. You don't need to pray, right? This is the areas that he comes to us that when we need to make a decision and we feel in desperation that we have a, we have a, a situation that we need an answer on, right? That something is going on in our family. And this is where, where oftentimes that we, we get nervous in the world. And we, what do we do is we, instead of praying and asking God to help us in the situation, we make our own decision. And this is where we need to be aware of that because this is where Satan works. He wants us not to go to the Father. He wants us not to go to him. He wants us to rely on ourselves. And this is one of the things that we need to be clearly aware of, the things that we are not to do. Um, I'll, I'll share the rest of them. That I, I think you guys uh, will love this. Um, and this comes from um, Matthew 4, um, 8 through 7. And I'll, t I'll share the rest of it. It's here. It's, it's so uh, powerful that we see. And this is, this is, I'm sorry, it's Matthew 4, 8 through 9. And it says, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. One of the things that it said there early on, it says, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. In the NIV, it says in their splendor. And so he see that this is the lust of the eyes, that he took him up and he tried to use the lust of the eyes on Jesus. He's trying to say, I'll give you all of this and look at the splendor of it, the beauty, the majesty of it. And this is the area that he was, same area that he tempts us. He was trying to tempt, uh, he was trying to tempt Jesus in this very same area. And so those were the, the lust of the eyes. And so we see here, and this comes from Matthew 4, 5, and 6. It says, then the devil took him up on the holy, uh, into the holy city and said to him, uh, on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands, they shall bear you up. Least you dash your foot against the stone. As he called him to go up onto the temple, many people would gather on the temple and he's calling Jesus to throw himself down, knowing that the angels, Satan knew exactly who Jesus was, knowing that the angels would catch him, but this would bring glory to him that all would come to know this is the messiah and it wasn't his time and it would bring it would bring glory to him and it was a time and we were not to use those things so this was the pride of life that he is speaking about but one of the things that i think is so powerful um and this is the last one it comes from uh, uh here matthew 4 um 4 and it says and this is how jesus defended himself he said it is written that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And this is where, where it is, man, you and me, this is where we have power, is that when we spend time in the word of God and we, we uh, abide in the word of God, this is a very, very powerful book. And I know many of you, uh, as, as, as I know different than you guys, that I oftentimes I spend uh, much time reading the word of God, but oftentimes as you spend the word, time in the word of God, that you are spending time with Jesus because this is the living, breathing word of God that he is speaking into our lives. And there isn't anything that, that is going on in our lives that the Bible does not have an answer for. There is not one thing that the Bible does not have an answer for. So here are the last verse tonight. It says in verse 17, and the, the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. One of the things we know that the world is passing away and some people deny it. We remember that there was people on the Titanic, right? They said that this ship is unsinkable. The Titanic, they went along and they were uh, eat, drink, and they were being merry on the Titanic. And they all thought that it was unsinkable until they hit the iceberg. We all know the story. They hit the iceberg and the, and the ship began to sink. And this is many times the way people in the world, they live their lives thinking that the world is not passing away, but one day is going to come that the world is going to, we're not going to hit an iceberg, but it's, the Bible says that it's all going to burn and that time is going to come and we're no longer going to be here, but we are not to put our things, we're not to put our, 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 our things in, in this world. We're not to put our, all of our treasures in this world. We are descended ahead. There's a quote from Martin Luther who said that he's held many things in his hand and he said, in many things I've, I've lost out of my hands. But he said, but the things that I've put in God's hand, I still possess. And this is what the areas that we are to think of as we think about that eternity, 
that we are to send our treasures into eternity and that we would have, um, that we would have uh, life in that eternal um, life that God has given us. But one of the things I wanted to close with tonight, I, last week I, I shared a story with you guys, the 12 words that would save your marriage. I, I, I shared this with you, but one of the things that I, that I, as was I was studying this week that I thought that it would be um, a little bit more, uh, it would be more helpful in those 12 words. It's like I talked about that the fruit that they're out there in the garden and, and, the, and the, the orange tree is trying to squeeze out an orange. And this is the same thing. We remember that the 12 words that we talked about last week, there were, the first ones were, I am sorry, right? Those were the first three words, right? I am sorry. And the, and the next ones were, I am wrong. Right? Did you tell your wife when you have an argument, I am wrong? And it, it was my fault. It's my fault. That was the next three. There's nine words. And the last ones were, I love you. But one of the things as, as I was contemplating these, and this is us as husbands, but we cannot grin and bear it when, when our wives, we have an argument with our wives, and we can't just say those, those 12 words and expect everything to go away and everything to be fine. Because one of the things is stopping us from saying those words is pride. It is the pride that we have. And so we need to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit and ask him to remove that pride with, from us that we would be able to tell our wives these 12 words and meet them and mean them with sincerity. And this is how truly that, that, that our marriages will be changed and it will be, and that we'll see that God will work in our marriages. It is powerful that we'll see that. Amen? Amen. So Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that um, the men you have gathered here, we thank you, Lord, for the people who are online, Father. May you minister um, to each and every one of our hearts, Father. We love you, Lord, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name.